if I understand your your uh, argument, we'll spell it out for anybody that's going to tune in. Um, the minimalist point would be kind of Joseph Smith was the OG, and everything after him is worth less um, than what he said. And the maximalist point would be whatever has been the latest uh, is what matters most. And regardless of what anybody else in the past said, the current prophet gives the most relevant information. Is that kind of your take on those two sides? Obviously, any such summary is oversimplified by necessity, though. Sure. And there's all sorts of nuance that we can flesh out. But I think that helps characterize at least different ends of the spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like you just mentioned here, I'm sure you could see it. There's different ways of approaching what constitutes official doctrine. And there's a spectrum there. But I've heard anything from only a subset of the LDS standard works as recently repeated in general conference, that kind of thing. Um, I've, mm -hmm. I've heard that minimalist var variation and I've heard, you know, uh, ideas that whatever is taught in general conference from the quorum of the 12 and the first presidency is as good as living scripture for the next six months. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? spectrum or if, if do you think it's a fair representation of a spectrum of LDS thought? I think it is. And I think it's helpful to at least how, the way I think about it to break up kind of two different segments of where that would apply. Um, one being doctrine and one being uh, current policies or practices, how that doctrine is implemented, if you will. And I think it's possible, I would probably place myself as far as our doctrine, more in the minimalist side, but in the policies and administration of the church, probably more on the maximalist side. Hmm. Yeah, the most extreme forms I've heard um, Remove Heavenly Mother because Heavenly Mother's not necessarily in the standard works. Whereas you would get that more from subsequent developments. So yeah, that would that would definitely be a very minimalist view. And I, you know, certainly you could look at breakoffs like Community of Christ as being the extreme end of the minimalist view, where the early Latter-day Saint teachings of Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon are viewed as authoritative, where the later ideas that, uh, you know, they would dispute whether that came from him or not. And uh, certainly they wouldn't look at those as being authoritative. And, uh, you know, you could kind of draw a minimalist line throughout Latter-day Saint history for some of those breakoff groups, like this, the, this far they'll go, but no further. You know, if there's groups that still practice polygamy. That would be a, min a minimalist take, right? Because they've decided that, that revelation was correct and anything since can't be. Or maybe have a different, maybe line of succession. Yeah. Priest yeah. succession view. Sure. Obviously, social, sola scriptura is a form of minimalism, a form of doctrinal minimalism. Uh, it, sola scriptura says that inspired divine speech given for the public life of the church has a special mm, role to play such that no other speech, no other <clears throat> written divine speech has that kind of authority that, that only yeah. scripture and can bind the conscience either explicitly or by way of uh, entailment. Uh, yeah. And I think the minimalist side of that would say that there's no more that's going to come, right? What's, what's been given is, sufficient and that there's nothing else that's going to follow that that uh, yeah i see the like the the closed canon idea is related but not identical because you could technically be you could technically hold to a doctrinal minimalism and yet hold out for future editions of scripture in the lds framework as i understand it yeah yeah you could say you know in a less minimalist position that anything that's in the standard works is doctrine and 
the standard works can be added to through the process that we have to canonize, right, by common consent and, right. Yeah, um, next slide. Priesthood keys. It some, some folks in maybe, I think they call it the Doctrine of Christ movement who are rejecting Brigham. It's interesting. It, they, as far as I could tell, they affirm him as a valid president, but don't affirm him as a, him as a called prophet. And they say that only Joseph Smith has the keys to this dispensation. Um, yeah, that would certainly be a very minimalist view. And there are, there are people that hold it. I think most members of the church, um, as far as the priesthood keys would take the maximalist position that those keys are essential to administering the church and that they've come down through Brigham Young, John Taylor, down to Russell and Nelson today. Yeah, just to be clear, this is a second form of, uh, this is a sec second spectrum. So to yeah. hold to this form of minimalism doesn't guarantee you hold to other slides or forms mm -hmm. of minimalism. It's interesting that um, obviously in the Protestant view, um, Jesus ultimately holds the keys, but they're administered through the life of the church. And there's different there's different views of church government. I'm a Baptist, so I hold to a voluntary gathering of a congregation, which as a gathered people exercise the keys. It's not given to the pastor or some special figure to exercise the keys. The church holds the keys. We would make an argument from Matthew 18, and elsewhere in Matthew, where it's sort of the, the fleshing out of how binding and loosing is done, is done by final appeal to the church, and then the church decides whether to put someone out of the of the church, whether to, and that that is, sure. a, is a, there's a unity between earth and heaven in that event um, of of the binding and loosing, and the exercise of the keys. Yeah, and I think we would both agree that Jesus ultimately holds them. It's the difference of, are they delegated to one person on earth that then delegates them further? Or like you say, in the in the Protestant view, are they just generally disseminated? Um, I have a somewhat related question for you. Any study by yourself of the Council of Nauvoo? Um, Council of 50? The Council of 50, yeah. The Council of 50 not, in Nauvoo, sorry. I have not had a chance to look at, you know, there's a new book published that that's a few years old now that uh, goes minutes. into like a lot of the meeting notes. And I have not had a chance to look at that very deeply. I've, I'm familiar with some of the things, but not a lot. What I was reading about the Council of 50 said that Smith had been declared to be the prophet, priest, and king. And that caught my eye. Um, mm-hmm. That that would definitely be a uh, an infinitely different position uh, for us Protestants who affirm Christ alone as being the prophet, priest, and king. Sure. Um, this is an interesting one. Can Mormonism genuinely outlast the hypothetical fall of the LDS Church? Um, I've and it's really recently that I've been hearing the minimalist form of this. I uh, my traditional interactions with Latter Day Saint members have fallen almost entirely squarely in the maximalist camp on this one, um, but I'm starting to hear more explicit articulations of the minimalist view here that that even if the LDS Church as a church fell or apostatized, um, something of the core of Mormonism could still persist. Uh, Jacob Hansen called this Mormon Protestantism in his debate <laughs> with Michelle Stone. It absolutely resonated with my Protestant sensibilities that the, the church and the kingdom and the movement of God's people um, isn't defined by a singular hierarchy or, or a singular visible institution. Yeah, that would certainly be a, not a mainline view among Latter-day Saints, but I'm, I'm sure that it's out there. 
just thinking back to uh, the official doctrine slide, Stephen Robinson, I think it was his book. It might have been um, How Wide the Divide. Blake Osler did a review of, I think it was that book, but it was something by Stephen Robinson, Stephen E. Robinson, wherein Blake said in his review that it, it he seemed to uh, approximate Sola Scriptura too much. And he was sort of chiding his fellow Latter-day Saint to have a model of officiality or of of a, a authorized theology that wasn't so Protestant-ish. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is an interesting one. It's like a spectrum here. Um, it's like how much do you ride or die on the late just on the late Joseph Smith? And I've met people who think that maybe he went awry, and maybe the Book of Abraham is not legitimate. Maybe the polygamy was wrong, the polytheism was wrong, but they stick to the Book of Mormon and validate his prophetic calling as legitimate. <clears throat> at least at the early years, whereas other Latter-day Saints see his whole prophetic, you call it tenure or career, as integral to his validity. Yeah, and I think that probably reflects a view of, you know, I, I know a lot of Protestants who are more familiar with our doctrine view, like the Book of Mormon as an early creation, and that it almost contains a separate understanding of God than things that Joseph Smith taught later, where I think a lot of maximalists would look at, uh, you know, the Book of Mormon and even the early revelations and the Doctrine and Covenants and say they, you know, they express a more, uh, a more central view. And maybe we'll get really fancy here because I didn't bring a slide, but... will really test my art skills here. Oh, you're, this is napkin art on the fly? Yeah. <clears throat> so if we were to draw a uh, tree, and we have here the trunk, right? And then the branches that come off of it. I think a maximalist would say that the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants represent this more uh, central part of the gospel. Mm. where some of Joseph Smith's later elaborations represent, um, you know, mysteries of the kingdom that exist more out here on the edge of the branches. And that even though it's an expansion on what came before, that it's still a unified doctrine, right? I think that would be a very maximalist view of how you integrate the Book of Mormon and its teaching that the doctrine of Christ is faith, repentance, baptism, reception of the Holy Ghost, enduring to the end, and that that is the gospel of Jesus Christ in its fullness, and still accept that there are other things that Joseph Smith reveals, you know, three degrees of glory, baptisms for the dead that come along later, and that those ideas don't conflict with each other. This is a hot button topic for our generation, this, it this era. Is. I've definitely met a lot of Latter-day Saints who are hopeful of and perhaps even expectant of the LDS Church at some point at least affirming the the goodness and civil legitimacy of same-sex marriages. Um, whereas I, th I think it seems like Jacob Hansen's taking more of a maximalist view on this that if the LDS church went in the direction of condoning or affirming same-sex marriage or LGBTQ identities um, fleshed out, then it would be a cause of, for concern and even at some point, hypothetically, a marker of apostasy. Um, yeah, I think a lot of the people who are embracing that are almost, I would call it, uh, you know, I'd kind of flip your view on it, the, the maximalist and minimalist, um, mm. going kind of even beyond maximalism to not just what modern prophets have revealed, but what they hope or expect that they will reveal in the future. And they're, uh, they're jumping even beyond current revelation into supposing that they know what will come in the future. 
um i i think that's i think that's uh, a kind of a dangerous position to take that you know what's going to come based on how you interpret what has come and um you know it leads to this uh this position of in fact rejecting what is now in favor of what you hope for will be um mm. and so it wouldn't be an, uh, an organic or natural development to go from the present sexual ethic or marital ethic of the latter-day saint church to uh, you know a progressive view that adopted same-sex marriage like that yeah and i, I think some of the key differences so a lot of latter-day saints will look at examples like the priesthood ban or the end of polygamy and say mm -hmm. see the church it's caved precedent. in the end and um that means that they will cave in the future um but i think there's some really important differences in both of those cases that that make them a bad model for how the church will handle uh same-sex questions uh going forward um you know, in, in the beginning, there was no priesthood ban, and the priesthood ban, by and large, was always understood to be a temporary thing. And with polygamy, from a doctrinal standpoint, you know, I have a similar idea that um, uh, the polygamy is instituted at certain times for certain purposes, but that it's not the norm. And so to try and say that because of those two things, you know, because those two change, that it means that same sex will change without a doubt, um, or at least could. Yeah. Well, I think you could say could is is a possibility, right? And so let's let's take the idea that that it does change down the road. Um, if that were to happen, then I think if you really have a have a true belief in prophetic keys and the ability to guide policies in the church and make changes, then I think there's a way you can still maintain your faith. The question is, will it? And I just don't think that it will. Now I could be wrong, but, but I don't think that people should just automatically assume that it will be. And I think that's where you get in trouble is if you're assuming that the doctrine will change. And I jump back to Take the priesthood ban, for example. The priesthood ban ended in 1978. If somebody in 1976 decided, well, this is going to change, so I'm going to start uh, ordaining people to the Melchizedek priesthood who fall outside of this ban, that person would not be in the right, because even though there, there was a change that happened, until that change happens, you can't just assume that it's going to and that, that it's okay to do what you want in the meantime question for you why not assume that such a shift to condoning or approving same-sex marriage would constitute an objective line of apostasy or heresy or rebellion yeah i think it goes back to the fact that the prophet as we view holds the keys to the kingdom of god on earth and that whatever decisions that the prophet and the majority of the 12 make uh, constitute what is right for the church to do. It sounds like you're a, a little bit left of Jacob Hansen on this. I don't want to speak for him or put words in his mouth, but as I understood his position, that would for him be a make it or break it moment. Yeah, I've, I've seen Latter-day Saints express that idea that if the church ever did make that change, that they would be out. Um, I kind of think that's the same the same danger that you get with this over maximalism of either way you're not going to follow living prophets as they as they make changes to our policies um how would you again, square that with existing scripture sorry to cut you off oh you're good well i think it would be difficult and that's why i think that it's not likely to happen i think the fact that our leadership is so clearly affirmed that these you know the proclamation to the family is based on doctrines that you know it's not just some invention that they made it reflects doctrines that that are eternal that have always existed and there doesn't seem to be any uh budging on that 
which is why I don't think that there will be a change. Um, but if I'm wrong and there is a change, then I would still be a Latter-day Saint. I would, hmm. I would expect there would be a lot of teaching surrounding why there was a change. Um, and I think a lot of people would have a really difficult time with it, but it yeah, you know, a matter as... of faith of, is there prophetic leadership? And if there is, then there's got to be a, a degree of trust there. One thing I will say, um, this would relate, I don't see this still in this uh, same-sex question, but I do see it in the priesthood band, because I think that's a that's one that a lot of people really have a difficult time with, understandably, right? Um, why was why was uh, priesthood bound allowed to happen if prophets really do speak for God? And <clears throat> why a change if that was really the right thing, right? Um, I tend to think along the lines of, you know, it's a Latter-day Saint belief that God reveals to us line upon line here a little and there a little, and as we're ready to receive it. Um, when you look at the attitudes that existed among everybody in the country at the time that the priesthood ban came into effect, there was there was definitely racism that existed among members of the church. No question. That was just part of the American fabric. Inherited and, in part from Protestantism. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Um, you know, we look from at Protestant uh, culture under, in America, I should say, not from yeah, what I would say is proper Protestantism, but yeah. Right. Uh, when you look at Israel anciently, they wanted a king, and the Lord warned them, no, I, you know, you really shouldn't have a king for these reasons. But in the end, they insisted and he permitted it. And I kind of view the priesthood band the same way that Brigham Young, uh, I don't I don't personally believe was commanded by God to institute it, but Brigham Young held the keys of administrating the church on earth. And if he administered or if he put it in place. He had the right to do that. Now, I think the timing of when it uh, when it was lifted is providential. And you know, if I've talked to members of the church who lived through that whole process, you know, and I asked a member if if the priesthood ban had been lifted in say 1940, what would the reaction of members of the church had been? And it would have been a really difficult thing for people to swallow at the time. Racism was still very prevalent all over the country. Utah was no exception. And, you know, the significant thing about when the, the ban was lifted in 1978 was, I, I read an account of a reporter who was there. It wasn't a member of the church, but he happened to be in, uh, in a, I don't remember where it was, somewhere in Salt Lake where there were a lot of members gathered when that uh, story broke on the radio. And when the when that news was announced he was really shocked by the fact that the members of the church were cheering for that news that they wanted that and you know i think in that case the lord waited to lift the ban until it was something that people wanted i think that the civil rights movement was was instrumental uh and uh it was a it was a process that was led by god you know you talk about the noble and great ones in Latter-day Saint belief, you know, we believe that certain people will, were held to come forth at certain times. And I think the leaders of the civil rights movement fall into that category. They didn't have a, a mission ecclesiastically in the church, but I believe that the mission that they had to change the hearts of people to accept all races as equal was a, was a mission from God and that they were chosen for that. And the, the lifting of the ban came at a time when people's hearts had changed to the point that they were ready to accept that change. Do you think that's something uh, framed in such a similar manner would happen with the LDS church with uh, adopting more progressive views of gender and marriage? I think there are people that would argue that. Um, but I think for the, for the doctrinal reasons that that leaders of the church today have expressed that that's not likely to happen. You know, in the Book of Mormon, um, it it says in Second Nephi that all are alike unto God, both black, white, bond free, male and female. 
there's a doctrinal base that's always existed in the church um, for viewing people as equals. And the priesthood ban existed in opposition to that doctrinal understanding. Whereas with LGBT issues, the doctrine is on the side of the traditional family, um, heterosexual marriage, and eternal families that consist of a man and a woman. Yeah, I've heard um, sort of att some attempts by Latter-day Saints to frame a queer theology which says that Brigham Young was wrong about spirit birth and that being children of God universally happened through adoption, pre-mortal adoption through Christ uh, without the need of a heavenly mother. So it was not a sexual union of any sort between heavenly father and heavenly mother. And that if intelligences can be adopted without the need of a sexual union, perhaps there, anyway, that's, that's what I've heard. Um, I guess, you know, there's different Latter-day Saint yeah. sensibilities and around that. I think the issues that we run into there are, you know, going back to that idea of a, a central branch central trunk of a tree and then things that exist out on the tips of the branches you know they're they're reaching out to the tips of the branches to try and find justification for beliefs that really strongly conflict with the core of the tree um which, which i just don't see ever ever being a change let's return to that i would love to return to that metaphor of yours as it relates to maybe monotheism and polytheism, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, it, you know, I think a lot of times the things that are exciting to talk about when we when we discuss Latter-day Saint beliefs are the things on the tips of the branches, right? Those are the things that are the most different between uh, mainline Christianity and Latter-day Saint belief. When we When we get further and further away from the trunk and out to the tips of the branches, those are where the biggest differences lie. And so that's where people want to discuss, you know, the plurality of gods or the nature of spirits before. Uh, yeah, topics that you would perhaps put up the, the the branches or the mm -hmm. twigs, we would put in the trunk. So the question of whether God has always been God or whether we can become rightly worshipped someday or whether God learns or has learned to become God, that's at the root. <laughs> for us it's like we sure. the, the positions and, we take on that are um they're so foundational that they are embedded even within the very things we teach to our children that god yeah. has always been god there's only one god yeah and on the flip side of that i think some of the things that latter-day saints view as um the trunk of the tree protestants are happy to disagree on and say that it matters less you know the question of baptism, of baptism. Yeah, great. Right. Yeah. For a Latter-day yeah. Saint, that is like, that is right there in, in the center, in the heart. And mm. for Protestants, they're happy to say, you know, we don't, we don't always agree on this. Um, or, yeah. And they, yeah. Have a, they have a lot of latitude there in their beliefs, right? Let me give you a, a tip, uh, not just you, but my Latter-day Saint friends, a very common rhetorical mistake that I hear. Uh, it's not such a mistake. It's just uh, helping hone down on better vocabulary at least in our community, mainline is something different than mainstream. That's good to know, because that's news to me. <laughs> I, yeah, I hear them used synonymously in the evangelical LDS dialogue, and I just substituted it in my brain for, for mainstream. But in our own community, mainline actually refers to like uh, LGBTQ affirming uh, Methodist denominations, oh. <laughs> PCUSA, so a mainline, uh, like if I was if I was talking with my friends about mainline organizations, they would typically be progressive apostate organizations that have rejected the authority. Of, they've re rejected inerrancy. They've rejected um, probably the historicity of some basic Old Testament events like the conquest. They reject penal substitution uh, or some sort of substitutionary atonement. So, I mean, mainline for us is like flag waving, like a rainbow flag waving Sort of the, the the churches that are historic buildings, uh, downtown Salt Lake City that used to be Orthodox in the early 1900s and today are just, um, I think it's called First Baptist Church of Salt Lake City and basically any PCUSA um, 
church. And so where does that where does that term come from originally? Is that something that's been applied later or oh, like man, what complete ignorance? What uh, when was that term for mainline first used to describe like a more liberal view of Christianity? I don't know. I see. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. Main mainstream is maybe mainstream what we might is yeah. Okay. Different than mainline. It's, it's funny, like uh, the word Methodist hundreds of years ago, um, at the time of uh, what's his name, Wilberforce. Methodist kind of had an evangelical feel to it. It kind of referred to this basic idea you'd had to be born again. And today Methodist means maybe refers more to like the denomination or or uh, something more particular. Evangelical has sort of taken over as our broad term of mainstream uh, faithful Christian churches. So, and so as ev evangelical, is that more of the, would be kind of the opposite of mainline then, more conservative, traditional Christianity? Rule of thumb as the term is used. Some use it in a, um, I've heard others use it in a way that is a broader umbrella to include progressives, but the way that the evangelical community uses it as I, as I use it and have experienced it, we, we have a red line and to you know, reject the Bible on sexual ethics is to basically cease to be a genuine evangelical. But you'll, you'll, you'll hear things like the new evangelicals and they're, they're, they're trying to take it in a more progressive way. But the way we commonly use the term is, you know, Trinity, uh, holding to biblical sexual ethics, reliability of the Bible, the importance of being spiritually born again, salvation by grace through faith alone, and so how do you see those things playing out in Christianity? So, you know, in the Latter-day Saint context, if you're a Latter-day Saint, there's a certain core that you're going to stick with if you really consider yourself at least part of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, right? Um, whereas in Christianity, you have a lot more room to move around and still be considered a Christian by a lot of people, right? If you jump from uh, an evangelical church into the, a mainline church, uh, a lot of people will still view that as, oh, you're a Christian. And the, the same type of backlash that you would get, say, from moving from an evangelical church to a Latter-day Saint church doesn't seem to exist there. In the communities that I traffic in, which would be, um, I would say, the broader conservative evangelical movement, moving to a mainline church especially for the reason of, say, rejecting the biblical sexual ethic on LGBTQ issues and same-sex marriage is itself an act of apostasy. Um, so we that's a red line for us. That's, that's identifying someone as rebellious and apostate, heretical, to use strong language. Do you think that somebody that makes that move, going from an evangelical to a mainline church, do they face the same kind of scrutiny and, uh, I don't know if rejection is the right word, that somebody would face if they went from a latter from evangelical to the latter-day saint yes equivalent i would even say uh in our seminary network for example among conservative baptists or presbyterians or conservative anglicans yeah that's like it's full stop heresy full stop rebellion full stop apostasy yeah it's it's, it's viewed as an equivalent type of move mm -hmm. it's it's in the same ballpark it's sexual heresy of sort of a high order. Uh, it It's clustered with a whole set of attitudes and it's sort of cutting ties with the Christian community on a whole, on a deeper level. It, it's, it's sort of like um, a cultural proxy war issue that is representative of a whole different attitude toward the authority of the Bible. And what do you see that playing out like in the future? You know, there have been a lot of issues like that over time, that over time, the, the church in general, Christianity as a whole, tends to migrate in a progressive direction. Yeah, it's a great point. Like uh, institutions tend to drift left. They tend to go liberal. Um, so we're, we're trying to police that border. Um, we're, we're trying to um, be vigilant about it. We, 
I don't know if this, it, tell me if this is a, an insufficient answer, but uh, we hold the line on that issue. If you're a church that is LGBTQ affirming, you are dis dissociated. You are, you are taken out of the cooperative. You're uh, excommunicated from the presbytery, you know, if you're a Presbyterian. So it's, it's for us, it's like, there's no, there's no, it's like, if you affirm female pastors, you might not fit in the conservative network of our denomination or our, or our association or network, but we would still affirm them probably as believers. Um, and there's a lot I of like, you got, even in my lifetime though, that seems to be a change. I, I've always known egalitarians who are just believers that, you know, it, it's a very uh, divisive issue, but for me, it's not an automatic red flag of apostasy. Culturally, it does seem to drift in that direction. Like probabilistically, you kind of wait for the other shoe to drop to see if, and, and you know, are they going to go all the way to being an LGBTQ affirming? And the way I've seen that play out in American culture is it does go in that direction. But I would be really careful not to stereotype or presume that of my egalitarian brothers and sisters in Christ. There's a lot of egalitarian evangelicals that are holding the line on the LGBTQ issues, like a guy named Robert Gagnon. Um, he's one of the fiercest voices against the uh, same-sex marriage uh, sort of zeitgeist. Um, and yet he's an egalitarian. So, Do you think in Protestant thought that has or will rise to the same kind of level as the difference between a Catholic and a Protestant? Like there will be another sort of group, if you will, formed of... Uh, you think it'll mm. go in that direction or? Hmm. Um, I mean, it's already happened. Like we already have yet. Yes. And I'm saying that retrospectively, like it's already happened. Like okay. we already have full denominations that have done that. Yeah. I mean, we've, we categorize them as false churches. They're not to, we're not in friendly communion with them. We don't affirm them as, as legitimate churches. There's a false church. It's if a schism that there's a there's a line drawn where, yeah, are there yeah are there a I, lot would even, I would even say that we we do that even more forcefully on this issue because early on in the Reformation there was still a lot of hope, you know, for the legitimacy of maybe like preserving or reforming the 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 Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I still think there's sometimes um, there's just different discussions about like, uh, and I'll just, I'll just put a pin on this because I don't really have super developed thoughts on this. So I don't want to speak uh, recklessly or ignorantly, but you know, you'll have Protestant discussions about J.R. Tolkien uh, and, and, and we're all like, he's totally a believer. <laughs> How do we make this work in our categories? The, the Pope <laughs> The Pope is at least of the spirit of the Antichrist and the Roman Catholic Church is a false church. Man, <laughs> Tolkien, he's he's one of us. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, we teach, uh, oh, come on, what's his name? Uh, Lewis. Mere Christianity. C.S. Lewis classes at BYU. So they're, they're, they're Latter-day Saints who are like, yeah, we'll... As he we'll spins in his grave. Adoption, right? I don't think he would appreciate that. <laughs> but... <laughs> Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, Lewis next... was one of those minds I think that transcends so many, so many religious divisions. Uh, man, screw tape letters and uh, mere Christianity, or uh, anybody could read and and gain from. His uh, mere Christianity was the first Christian book I ever read, and it had profound impact on me. Thinking especially of his moral argument for God, that. Apart from God, there is no true good and evil to speak of. That was really helpful to me. Um, next slide. Go, oh, go, ahead. go ahead. Sorry. Oh, just the, uh, the idea he also presents that I think we all realize it, but when it's said in a certain way, it hits you differently, that Christ is the only God who said, I'm going to come. And then he did come. And you know, it gives us reason to look forward to him coming again. There's no other God that's predicted that he will and then actually condescended to earth, right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, uh, put a pin on that. 
maybe future uh, revisit vi revisiting of that. Um, humanism and neo orthodoxy. I'm sort of borrowing phrases here from Kendall White. He has a book called Mormon Neo Orthodoxy. Okay. And he traces two different sort of streams of LDS thought. This is sort of a repeat of maybe an earlier slide, but the idea here is that the Book of Mormon teaches a more Protestant-ish view of grace. There's some asterisks on that, um, kind of deserves more discussion. But there's like a there's a very clear stream of thought within the LDS tradition that's more comfortable talking about meriting eternal life, earning exaltation. Um, sort of the, the language that borders on perfectionism at times, um, sort of the Spencer Kimball, Spencer W. Kimball, um, vein of thought. And it's situated inside of this network of ideas about becoming a God who can be worshiped or that God himself became a God. And so the merit system and the view of God and the view of how we progress is all wrapped up. So it's, it's mutually reinforcing. I like that phrase. It's mutually reinforcing ideas within the traditional LDS thought that seems to bend in the direction of a merit system at some level. Whereas the neo-orthodoxy view tends to reject the regress of deities, tends to reject the idea that we could be worshipped someday as this in a similar manner as Heavenly Father is, um, tends uh, tends to kind of play down those later developed ideas and try to retrieve a theology that's more historically represented by the original intent of the Book of Mormon in 1830, at least the English translation. So um, I've, I've met people that are on very, I mean, uh, just really clear examples would be like, um, should you have all your sins forgiven prior to baptism? Uh, my my first exposure to DNC 20, which taught that the baptismal candidate had to have all their sins forgiven prior to baptism, was given, that was exposed to me by a neo-Orthodox LDS friend. And then, of course, there's a lot of, um, on the street, I'll meet people that are in the same vein as Blake Osler. They, they're very aware of the LDS tradition, that there's a, a heavenly grandfather, but they just explicitly and consciously reject it. This, I even talked to a guy named Braden last night who took this view. Um, but it's very, it's very consciously reject it, it. It's it rejects later developments and tries to go back to the original source documents of the Book of Mormon and a rereading of the King Vault discourse. That the King Vault discourse is not explaining how God came to be God, but rather it's explaining how God, the Father, came to have a body. Um, mm. Interesting. Yeah. And now, so Blake would, asked, yeah, go for it. Sorry. I mean, I ran. I would up. probably fall somewhere in between there. I, I think a lot of those, um, a lot of those questions I would hold in abeyance as to I'm open to it kind of covering a range and I don't know where the answer lies. Like for the King Follett discourse, for example, I think, I think to some degree, if you really believe Joseph Smith's a prophet, you're going to agree with the statement that God was once a man like we are here. Now, we've talked in the past, and I think that the full reading of that leans more towards uh, the Father was once like Christ. Um, but I think there's a range of belief there that I would hold saying, I don't really know the answer. Was he a man like me? Was he more like Christ? Uh, I would lean in one direction, but I'm open to being corrected there. Um, you know, this neo-orthodoxy view that you're talking about where we have to retreat from all of those positions. Um, I think to some degree, there's wisdom in retreating from those as being, we need to, to have a systematized answer that everybody agrees on versus saying, um, you know, there's some mystery there that we don't have all of the answers to, but I would, I wouldn't personally reject those ideas. I would say that we just don't see clearly how they come. You know, you know, for a Latter Day Saint, I think if you're standing in the trunk of the tree, the further you look out towards the branches, the more the details of them become obscured, and 
I, I do think we have to be careful about forming an opinion of this is how it must have been versus um, acknowledging that there is something there. We just don't know exactly what it looks like because you can point to a lot of different leaders in the past of the Latter-day Saint church who will give you a different answer, right? Is it spirit birth as taught by Brigham Young or, or, you know, what was Orson Pratt's view? What was Joseph Smith's view? If you try and reconcile those into one perfect view, I don't think you're going to get there. And um, so it's not, you know, it's not like a perfect system in the sense that all the dots have been perfectly connected, but I, I would hope that within the LDS evangelical dialogue, there's at least a recognition that there are at some level competing, I'll call them subsystems of mutually reinforcing, mutually reinforcing related thought. So there's like connected ideas that come in a package that drift more in the uh, neo-Orthodox camp. And there's a, another set that drift more in the, um, I'm not sure what to call it, like a, I'll call it maximalism or a humanist view here where um, mm. there's more of a, a proud uh, affirmation that God and man are of the same species um, on a different, yeah. But, so yeah. The, but, the, but the big idea is that like, even though, like I, I would say that in Protestantism, I'd, I'd easily say that our theology is still maturing. Historic Christianity's theology is still maturing. But I would still be able to say like, um, you have this historic core especially with respect to the Trinity and the two natures of Christ. And the, the, the ideas around that and the attributes of God are all mutually reinforcing. And then you have different systems that different traditions have developed that have mutually reinforcing ideas at some level. Anyway, I would just hope that my Latter-day Saint friends would not sell themselves short, thinking themselves not to have a system. Uh, well, they, I think they, there's they, a system. And I think it can be frustrating for Protestants to try and communicate about it because there's so much diversity in Latter-day Saint thought. And I think sometimes Protestants feel like we're being evasive because we're not giving a direct answer to those questions. Um, you know, when sometimes, they'll ask, do you believe in a yeah. plurality of gods? Uh, you know, on, on the one hand, a Latter-day Saint would maybe kind of hem and haw about how do I answer that question in a way that reflects what I really believe? And a Protestant might look at that and say, why can't you just give it to me straight? Like, tell me what you believe. And there can be some frustration there. Um, because, uh, you know, as you said, in Protestant thought, those are very well-developed ideas that are widely agreed upon. Yeah, even universally, at you know, that God has always yeah. been God. Yeah. Yeah, and that's another discussion to have, like the role of lang religious language in our different communities. Um, I'm coming more and more to the conclusion that Latter-day Saints and evangelicals, we don't merely differ on the definitions of our terms. I would say we also differ on the importance of the definition of terms. And the di we differ on the function of language when expressing those differences. I think we have different sensibilities or different sensitivity levels to the need to define up front what we mean uh, there's a lot going on there. Um, so what would be an example? Give, give me an example of what you're thinking of. On the street, like recently experienced would be me making the point that, you know, we, we believe that God has never learned and never received a gift and that he's always been God. And then there's a sort of a reflexive, sustained for a while, affirmative. We believe that too. We, we believe the same thing about that. We share those ideas and then, you know, I'm I'm trying to be kind and patient about this. There's a lot going on. I don't want to assume the worst. But a lot of times what happens, and it has happened very recently, is you start pulling the thread on that. And then only minutes later, it's like, well, God, you know, might have learned everything he knows. And he might have received nearly everything he has. And he's been... God for as long as we can tell, and as far as it is relevant to us, but there may have been a time when he was not yet God. 
And so I'll circle back and I'll say, what did you mean when you said you agreed with the idea that God has never learned, never received a gift, has always been God, never became a God? Because it sounds like when you affirmed that, you actually, you at least mentally arrived at a definition that meant the exact opposite of what <laughs> you were affirming. And and I, I know I'm trying not to be like demonize my conversation partner, but I'm like, like what? It's like, is it like a a desire not to be in conflict? Is it a desire not to be sort of identified as different? Um, is there some level of indifference or sort of a mental shutdown? Or is it um, is it like a different level of comfort with using those language to mean like in the Latter-day Saint tradition to say that God never learned anything can mean that he learned everything he knows? Um, it, you know, it's kind of like language functions differently in the Latter-day Saint <laughs> community to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, and you, you make a good point. Like when a Latter-day Saint thinks that, are they thinking of uh, just as it pertains to the, not the amount of time that we have revelation for versus when you ask the question, you're going back like forever, right? Um, and so the idea that God was once a man and, uh, took place in a mortal existence and rose to the station of exaltation directly conflicts the idea that you're getting at. Whereas when you ask them the question off the cuff, they're, they're thinking in, in terms of how they view it. Yeah, that's correct. You just mean something very different than what you're asking. Yeah. That's the last slide. And I think so in so many cases we get into trouble when we talk back and forth like this, because, uh, you know, you'll ask a question and we'll give our answer, but we're, we still need to go back further to get at what is being asked here. Right. Um, which, which can lead to a lot of misunderstandings. Takes a lot of work. Yeah, I've does. been reading about the, uh, the council of Nicaea lately, giving a lecture on July 20th at the research center in Draper. And, um, the, the frustration with the Aryan position wasn't merely that they thought that there was a time when the sun was not and that Christ was essentially a creature. Um, that's the Aryan position simplified. But the the frustration wasn't merely over the content of those positions. The frustration was also over the use of language to obscure those positions. And so the, the accusation was that they were using the surface or the veil of biblical language to hide the meaning. Uh, and, and so they would use phrases like Jesus is the firstborn. And, and, and so there's this religious dialogue and it, it felt hard to pin them down sometimes about what they meant. And I was like, man, this feels so familiar to me. It, it, um, <laughs> uh, it felt like the same, the, 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 the conclusion that early Christians came to was that to best defend the meaning of scripture, you eventually have to go outside the language of scripture to articulate what you think it means and to to stick with just the superficial language of scripture is actually a, an unfaithful way to hold on tight to the meaning of it the substance of it um yeah it's like words, it, was, it was kind of their way to be more more refined in how they were presenting their idea um as a fruit of reflection on scripture not as, as an addition to scripture but as a, right. as, a, as a faithful way of metaphysically articulating the content of scripture. What, what they felt the meaning of scripture was, they're defining it further to clarify how they feel it, it should have been read. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, um, we kind of use that in both directions. Um, you know, when, when I'm presented with the question from a Protestant of, oh, you believe that you can become a god, right? When I answer that, I try and answer that in a way that reflects my scriptural understanding of that. And so a lot of times we'll turn to uh, John 17 
and look at the language where it says that uh, Christ followers will become one with him or to Revelation uh, 3, uh, 21, where it talks about um, those that overcome, they will sit down with me in my throne as I am sat down with my father in his throne. Not in a way to try and pull the wool over somebody's eyes, like, see, we believe the same thing as you, but to try and say, okay, the reason that we believe this is this is what our understanding of that scripture would be. Um, but, I, but you're right that... Uh, there could be a feeling there, or there could even be an intent. Uh, uh, what's the word? Um, an attempt or a motivation on the part of some people to try and hide their belief behind the language of Scripture uh, to try and make it seem like we believe the same thing. And I, I think it's important if you're using the language of Scripture in a way to try and relate, to also be clear that this is how we read this, but we understand that it's a different reading than you would take and you hold it as a different meaning, right? Yeah, I wonder if it would be helpful to think in two parts in such dialogues. Uh, the first part being, this is the language we use that we find rooted in scripture. And part two, up front, this is what we think it means or entails. So I, yeah. I would prefer that my Latter-day Saint neighbors would say, um, uh, I mean, at least if you're on a maximalist kind of uh, camp, um, we believe we're heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. I think that's Romans 8, 17. Mm -hmm. And we think that means we can be worshipped someday as governing beings who begat our own spirit children. I mean, that kind of like like forceful clarity is it's like it's like a it's like a jolting. Uh, I don't know if that's very, you know probable or plausible to get that kind of forceful clarity, but, um, or at least to say something like, which may or may not entail the following, at least that would be helpful. Um, I remember having yeah. like a, a 45 mm -hmm. minute discussion with a friend named Bob and we went on for a long time and he was insistent that God has always been God from all eternity. And then at like the 45 minute mark, he said, well, in this eternity, <laughs> and, and i i felt so duped i felt like it was so not helpful to friendship or dialogue or clarity or truth i wish he had just said up front well i would use the language that god has god been god from all eternity but i would mean something different than what how you would use that same language in your community uh what i what i mean i would rather him say what i mean when i say that god has been god from all eternity is that in another eternity he was not god and that when he became God, he entered into another eternity, something to that effect. That, um, Sure. And it, when you're not clear in that way, like you say, you walk away feeling like, well, you, were, you weren't representing your beliefs then, or you were trying to hide or avoid a question of, um, you know, um, being pressed on that or, or whatever. No, it, it is beneficial, especially when you're interacting with somebody who really has uh, a lot of background in trying to get at some of these deeper questions. They've right? thought about the ideas. Right. If if you're talking to somebody who's never thought much about religion or scripture at all, you need to have a level of simplicity there that you're going to get them in the door, give them some milk before you make them choke down their steak. Um but I also would I would say like there are certain there's a lot of things in my theology in my life walking with Christ where I have language from Scripture, but I don't know what the language fully means yet. So oh, uh, yeah. I'm I'm receiving theology for me is not merely about ideas, it's about receiving the revelation of God's choice of language, inspired particular words that he breathed out and I'm receiving that language and I'm, I'm sort of like, I'm swimming in it for a couple more thousand years to, it's like the word offspring in Genesis three, that the promise of a future offspring that would crush the head of Satan. It's the, what's the offspring. Uh, and it, it kind of develops to have messianic flavor over time. This at least conceptually, and then it arrives at a person in Christ. Um, and so there's certain things about like the apocalypse or the second coming 
where I would say, well, I have language for it, but I'm not quite sure what it means yet. And part of my faithfulness is not merely thinking clearly about the ideas available to me, but it's about adopting the choice of words that God has meant for me to meditate on till his second coming. And I would say the same thing for like some Trinitarian language. Um, Jesus is the only begotten, eternally begotten son, as Christians would historically say. Um, if you press it, well, what do you mean by that? And I, I bump up against a wall and I say, uh, I'm not entirely sure, but I, <laughs> I can, I can at least affirm the language and reason analogically. That's a really helpful to me. There's, uh, historically I thought about inductive, abductive and deductive language, but in the history of a Christian Trinitarian thought, we also have analogical reasoning where we're taking the analogy of scripture and we're helping those, we're, we're thinking through those titles as mutually reinforcing, but it's not as like precise as maybe the sciences are, um, well, and I, so I, I, think I would want to make room for my Latter-day Saints to say things like, well, this is the language we use, but I'm not sure what that language entirely means yet. It at least means this, and it doesn't mean this. Yeah, I think it's helpful when we have charity for one another. And in the areas where we don't have a, a perfect answer, we don't jump on the other person. And, you know, it's common and um, you'll see it from a lot of Latter-day Saints who want to attack the Trinity and they're trying to press for an answer of what is the difference between a person and a being? And that is a question I've gotten a very wide variety of responses to. And the fact that there's not one answer that every Christian will give you is not room to jump down their throats and say, well, that means that you're wrong any more than the questions that a Protestant might pose to a Latter-day Saint about what does it mean for you to become a God? And will you have your own planet? And all these other questions that like to get thrown out. When we say, you know, I don't know. There should there should be room for us to both say that in our own spaces and that be okay. Like, oh, all right. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with the Trinitarian saying, this is what I think it could mean, the difference between a person and a being. And this is how I view it. And this is how I understand it. Um, and if it's different than another Trinitarian, I don't have to feel the need to attack that and, uh, you know, demand that that be reconciled, right? We all, all of us have a level of mystery in our understanding of God that is going to exist. We are mortal fallen men. He is immortal and perfect and exists on a much higher plane than we have the ability to comprehend that there's going to that, be mystery there. I know there's a difference here with the, at the lay level and the sort of the, you and me, you and you and I are armchair apologists, armchair theologians, um, at some level. But and so I know there's a difference between just the lay level and then those who kind of have geeked out for a while on this stuff. But I would hope that at least that at least for those that Protestants and Latter-day Saints who have thought about it, I would hope that we could at least, when we say we don't know, maybe we could add something like, I don't know, but here's the major um positions in the history of the community that I belong to. Here's how major thinkers in my own faith tradition have approached this issue. Um, and here's how different systems maybe attack that. Um, so I mean I would love to see that. Um, I would of course love to see my Protestant brothers and I grow in our understanding of our own history and our own systems and our own, of course, the, the biblical text. Um, and I would love for my Latter-day Saint friends to, it, it, it seems like it would only help the conversation if we were thinking historically, scripturally, and systematically, all three of those, if we were letting all three of those have a role to play. And then I would add culturally, like, you know, what I hear on the street <laughs> or institutionally is like, when, you know, uh, he's, he's a softball, like, um, is Adam God? Um, a Latter-day Saint mates might say, I don't believe that. Uh, it's very rare to meet a Latter-day Saint today that believes that. Um, our leader did teach that um, in such and such capacity, and it was ultimately rejected. Um, 
that would be like so helpful. I mean, that would just be like, it would just, it would just, and, and maybe we'd have a follow up discussion about how important it is or how valid it is to have a true prophet who gets something like that wrong. But, um, just sure. And whether yeah. it's uh, a bug or just the way things are, you know, I think in both religions, there are probably a majority of people who are happy to go on never approaching those kinds of questions or, you know, they, they just, um, they're happy to uh, live out a more simplistic view, which I think is unfortunate. You know, on my mission, I remember we had a zone conference once talking about treasuring up the word of God and the importance of um, not just reading the scriptures, but as you read, take that in, internalize that, reflect on those phrases over and over. And uh, how do they connect to each other? Where do we see them recur? Um, journal about your feelings, uh, mark up your scriptures, refer back to those concepts. And over time, as you do that, your understanding of them is going to change and going to grow. But it takes a lot of work to do that, right? And sadly, there are a lot of people who don't want to invest the time and energy to give that kind of attention to their gospel study. Um, now, I don't think that necessarily means it always has to result in going down the road of apologetics, right? There are certain people who are interested in apologetics and they want to have those discussions and they want to give answers to those questions. Somebody like my mom, I love her to death, but she has no interest in that and never will. And that's fine. She doesn't need that as part of her faith. She's happy to read the Book of Mormon, read general conference talks and follow the spirit as it guides her in that, in that line. Um, and I don't think it would matter if she was a Latter-day Saint or a Protestant, either direction, she's not going to end up on a road of diving deep into apologetic thought. Um, I think where I, the, right where I agree with you is like, not everybody needs to be a nerd. Right. Uh, but, or... but where it is important is she still needs to be treasuring up the words of eternal life, right? Diving into the scriptures and giving great thought to what are these words yeah. and how do I apply them in my life? It, and that seems that's uh you know even I think there's a danger in apologetics of us getting caught up so much in uh looking for the for the answers to um the mysteries that you forget to focus on the core and treasuring up Christ. Christ is central to everything else and the rest of it may be interesting but our our study and our reflection should always refer back to Christ and his atonement and how we apply that in our lives. Jesus said that the greatest commandment was to love the Lord, your God with all your heart. I sh actually, I should rewind. Uh, in one of the four gospels, it starts with hero Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord, your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind, with all your strength. So it's inescapable that a faithful Christian will make a, uh, a willful, emotional, and intellectual pursuit out of knowing as much as God makes available to us in our present circumstances and what he's revealed in his word. So I wouldn't want to judge anyone for not being a nerd, but um, it, it, we are called to seek him, um, to doggedly love the truth, to go after it, even at great sacrifice. In the book of Proverbs, there's a theme of getting wisdom at all costs, uh, even if it costs you all your wisdom and uh, all your uh, silver and all your gold, uh, that it's more precious than silver. It's more costly than gold, um, but it's worth it. Uh, getting wisdom, uh, if nothing else, get wisdom. And it starts with the fear of the Lord. So it, it's, uh, um, I, I'll tell you, I'll just on a personal level, Switchfoot was really helpful for me. And did you ever listen to Switchfoot? No, <laughs> no. Okay, well, uh, I have something to look. Your at. loss. Uh, it's anyway. It was is it was a <laughs> band I listened to in the very early two thousands, and what John Foreman really helpfully sung was, um, I. I'll say it's existentialism, but I mean something specific by it. I mean, like, uh, find out what's 
true and throw your whole being into it. So the thorough idea of vote with your whole, your whole self, throw your whole subject, your whole person into what most matters. Um, uh, I, is a famous song. I dare you to move or uh, we were meant to live for so much more. I, that, that posting of the American life is so deadly and to know God, Jesus Christ says, eternal life is this, to know God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So at all costs, to seek wisdom and to know God and to know the truth, Jesus says, uh, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Yeah. And yet the even more important thing is charity, right? Paul says, if I know all things and yet I have not charity, I am nothing. And man, I struggle with that. Like I, all the time, I'll think things that are uncharitable or, or uh, fall short in that. And if, if the, what we know isn't used for love, then it's. Yeah. Or even to the point of if I sit locked in my room all day reading the scriptures, but my neighbor across the street who's going through chemotherapy needs her lawn mowed and I just look out the window and pray somebody will take care of it, right? There's a disconnect there. Uh, true religion is... Uh, Not just headspace. Yeah. Yeah, well, appreciate the dialogue. Obviously, we're very different ends of the spectrum is not a good term for here, but we're categorically different, I would say, in our religious convictions. Um, I uh, appreciate you. I, I do believe you worship a different God with a false gospel, but I appreciate the dialogue and I hope to improve upon the evangelical LDS dialogue to make these topics really clear and uh, conversable, something that it can at least be intelligible and talk. That's something that can be talked about in a courteous way. Well, and it's important, you know, I, I think there's a real importance for understanding and go both ways there, right? A Latter-day Saint has a difficult time expressing their beliefs if they don't understand the Christian mindset um, and where those differences exist and how those different terms are used. And I think a lot of times that's what happens is we'll say, yeah, we believe that, not understanding that there is a difference of belief there hmm. and not understanding how different some of our views are. And so when we say we believe the same thing, it's because we're assuming that there's a, there's the same belief there, which a lot of times isn't the case. And, you know, if, if we really want to understand each other, there, there has to be that dialogue of, okay, what does this mean to you? Oh, really? That's surprising. That's different. I didn't expect that. Um, you know, I think a lot of the, and escaping some of those, cultural ideas that we have placed on Christianity, right? I get so frustrated when I see a Latter-day Saint post. I'm sure you've seen the meme of Jesus praying and the caption is, hello, God, it's me again, you, right? Thinking that they're bashing on the Trinity. They've, they've owned them, right? Well, no, that's not the Trinitarian understanding of that's modalism, is. Patrick, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And as long as we, as long as we keep those barriers up where we don't understand what another person believes, we're not going to connect on expressing what is, what is my belief and how is that different? And, um, you know, escaping the frustration of feeling like we're not, we're talking past each other and we're not really communicating. I just had a phrase pop in my head, um, boundaries, but not barriers. Yeah. And I don't know if you've watched, uh, pastor jeff's channel at all i think uh you know i there are a lot of latter-day saints who are very skeptical of him and afraid of him as far as he's he's a wolf in sheep's clothing he's trying to sneak in and convert people out of the lds church because you know he he's comparing his beliefs to our beliefs and i suppose if you're not secure in your beliefs then yeah, I guess maybe you should be cautious. But I think that the value there of having somebody who's willing to go into the opposite person's space and ask questions and say, point blank, 
this is this is why I have a difficult time believing that, or this is how I view it that's different. Um, I think that's really valuable. And I think uh, the ability to learn about another person's beliefs without feeling threatened, um, that that somehow diminishes your own would serve, a, would serve us all really well. Like the, what's the phrase he uses all the time? Um, fighting, uh, fighting, cur cur fighting criticism with curiosity. Yes. If I had That's to right. impr improve upon that phrase, I know my brother, Jeff, uh, very much excels at kindness and patience, but if I had to improve upon that phrase, I would be, um, compliment and by compliment with an E, not an I, not like, like a, well-wishing compliment, but more like a, a well-suited complementary relationship. Compliment curiosity with criticism or compliment criticism with curiosity. I, I think they, they um, my, my criticisms are best informed by curiosity. And my curiosity is most honest when I'm overt about my criticisms, if I could say that. It's like, I want to be both. I, I want my cards to be face up with my criticisms. And I want to maintain a curiosity, if for nothing else than for the sake of love. Love wants to know your neighbor. Uh, love requires yeah, I, a, a degree of curiosity. I think, uh, you know, there's a difference of approach that you take versus, versus him. Um, you know, for example, the God Loves Mormon channel versus Hello Saints. Those are very different tones. It would be interesting to know. Um, I've never looked, but who you're reaching and and how that's received. And uh, I don't I don't want to say which is more effective, um, but like, what are the differences in in uh, maybe philosophy or outcomes? I don't know. Yeah. How, how okay. To say that, but. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good conversation to have. I'd, I'd look, like to see how that plays out. Um, I ultimately think that Jeff, as an evangelical Christian, um, shares the same fundamental convictions that the LDS Church is a false church, and that people would that at least it would be best if people um, jettisoned the traditional distinctive teachings of the LDS Church and um adopted a more historic christian viewpoint but i'm saying that probably with more pointedly than uh i don't know I, I, well and i think that's uh why some people feel like he is a threatening voice because uh you know it seems that some latter day saints uh if someone believes that then that means that that person needs to be spurned or not listened to or whatever mm -hmm. um I did some From the standpoint I, of looking sorry. to that person as a source of truth. Yeah, I think there's there's a right to that, right? A, mm -hmm. uh, evangelical would not look to a Latter Day Saint as this is a peer who I'm going to uh, receive all of my gospel teaching from, right? That that would be a, a threat to their evangelical beliefs. Um, now, if they're interested in investigating the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints for the purpose of determining if it's true, yeah, then you would turn to that person. And in a like way, if a Latter-day Saint was trying to investigate evangelical uh, thought, then it would be fair to have them turn to an evangelical voice to get that, at least for some of their information, right? Yeah, there's a lot there. Different philosophies of engagement, different modes of communication. Um, my favorite text is from second Timothy two, which says, uh, paraphrasing, um, flee youthful desires. Don't quarrel, um, flee use, useless controversies, pursue righteousness, faith, and love with those who call upon the Lord with a pure heart. Um, and it goes on to say, I'm paraphrasing, uh, be patient as you teach your opponents with kindness correcting them with gentleness, I think, and knowing that God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth after having been ensnared by the devil to do his will. Pardon the uh, messy quotation there. Um, but the, the components there are like avoid quarrelsomeness, which I've had to repent of, avoid uh, youthful passions and useless controversies. Had to rep I've had to repent of that. 
over and over again. Um, teach and correct with kindness. So I'm correcting, uh, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, uh, not to practice cunning or deceit, but by open statement of the truth, commend yourselves to the conscience of man in the sight of God. Um, so there's a kind of forthrightness, a correction, a, a straightforward teaching, and yet there's a kindness and a patience, patiently enduring evil, uh, Paul says. So I want to do that. And at the very least, you know, with interfaith dialogue, I, I don't want to keep my evangelistic motivations like, like poker when you keep your cards down. I want my cards to be up. I don't want to do poker evangelism. I want you all to know my upfront. I, I've tried to do this in recorded uh, interviews this past couple of weeks. The first minute, I'm a born again Christian. I have an, an evangel I have an evangelistic agenda. Um, don't be surprised. And I try to help my interviewees understand that before we even push the record button. Um, and You're and yet, kidding. like the dialogical component of that is like it's not like me wanting to know more about how you think genuinely as a person and as a neighbor because i care about you and because i'm curious about the world and curious about you know things around me is i think it it can concur or coincide well with this evangelistic drive that i have yeah and i think there's room for both and a lot of times there's overlap um but sometimes it's it's helpful just to say here are here are similarities here are differences um but if your if your motivation is, I want to share this with you so that you will investigate it for yourself and and uh, consider it. Yeah, it's helpful to be upfront about that, or somebody's going to walk away feeling lied to, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't I don't want people to feel um, bait and switched. You know? Yeah. Hey, I'm sure we're at the stretch of our our so called hour of length here, but uh, thanks for doing the chat. Another time, yeah, another another topic. Sounds good. Take Have care, good Scott. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.